Hello friend, I'm Dr. Abhishek Naudari and I'm back with my next video on the clinical snippets from neuroanatomy. So let's get started. Friend, like I already emphasized, it is the integration between anatomy and physiology and medicine which is the key in success in any examination like NEXT or NEET. The questions in anatomy and physiology are no longer straightforward my dear friends. You need to integrate your knowledge of anatomy and with medicine to get your question right. Recent NEET was also a grueling 300 hour long OPD session where every question was like a patient attending you in your ward. So we need to develop our approach of seeing why is it important to study this in anatomy. What is the clinical significance of this? So I designed three or four questions in such a way so that we need to understand the importance of neuroanatomy and anatomy in the screening for diseases in medicine. So let's get started. A 34 year old male begins treatment with combination chemotherapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma. Shortly thereafter, he experiences severe vomiting and requires fluid supplementation. Which of the brain sites is responsible for his symptom? Friends, this is a very easy question, but you need to identify the site of the brain responsible for his vomiting. So chemotherapy for Hodgkin's lymphoma, experiencing vomiting, what is the brain site involved responsible for the vomiting? So with the integration of your knowledge of pharmacology, anti-cancer drugs, there are four common side effects of any anti-cancer drug. The first one is bone marrow suppression. The second one is mucositis leading to diarrhea. The third one is nausea and vomiting. So vomiting is common with any anti-cancer drug, my dear friends. But you need to know the area of the brain which is involved, which is causing vomiting as a response to this drug. So let's see this in detail. Again, my dear friends, this is a case of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma are very, very important questions in pathology. So you cannot leave them. There is no competitive exam without a question on Hodgkin's lymphoma or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So, my dear friend, I am asking you, what is the treatment protocol or chemotherapy regime for Hodgkin's lymphoma? What is the treatment protocol and chemotherapy regime for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? Anyone there? Yes, my dear friends, it is the ABVD regime, which is the treatment protocol for Hodgkin's lymphoma and it is the CHOP regime which is the hit treatment protocol for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Friends, you cannot just leave this topic here. Whenever you see the word of Hodgkin's lymphoma in the medicine topic or anatomy topic, you should go back to your pathology notes and read about Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In this way, you will be able to integrate the thing. So, integration is the key to success in any competitive exam. So, think of the words you read last day. Think of the words you read last month and integrate between the subjects so that it becomes easier for you in your revision. So now dear, my dear friends, can you elaborate what is ABVD regime and can you elaborate what is CHOP regime? Yes. So our CHOP regime or CHOP regime is the regime which is commonly used for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It includes R stands for rituximab, C stands for cyclophosphamide, H stands for hydroxydonorubicin, O stands for Oncovin or Vincristin and P stands for Rednicillin. Again, my dear friend, R-CHOP regime for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and R-CHOP regime is the newest regime which is followed for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and you cannot answer CHOP regime if R-CHOP regime is given because rituximab, a CD20 inhibitor, reduces the inflammation and increases the efficacy of the CHOP regime. So rituximab has been added newly and you must be thorough with the newer guidelines, especially for examinations like AIMS, where the examiner tends to ask newer guidelines, newer treatment protocols, and newer procedures. So, Archop regime is the regime which is used for non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, my dear friends, by your pharmacology knowledge, you must be aware of the side effects of each of the following drugs. What is the side effect of cyclophosphamide? Yes, my dear friends, it is hemorrhagic cystitis and it is relieved by giving mesna. Yes, and you must also know that cyclophosphamide is also associated with the development of bladder carcinoma. Yes, my dear friend, it is weird that cyclophosphamide is an anti-cancer drug, but it itself also causes another known cancer, which is bladder cancer. So, secondary leukemia is the side effect of some of the anti-cancer drugs. 
they itself are used to treat cancer but they also cause cancer in the long run so they work as a double edged sword so the most common drug most common alkylating agent which is associated with the development of secondary leukemia is procarbazine and nitrosouria so you must be aware that all the alkylating agents can cause secondary leukemia so i have integrated pathology and pharmacology in this question of anatomy so you must read this any subject in this way my dear friends what is the side effect of oncovin oncovin wind christian and wind blastin these are the spindle poisons and the most common side effect of wind christian is my dear friends deep peripheral neuropathy yes what is the side effect of hydroxy donorubicin it is an anthracycline group of drug of anti cancer drug and the side effect of this is cardiomyopathy mostly both restrictive and dilated cardiomyopathies can be caused by hydroxy donorubicin and doxorubicin these are cardiotoxic drugs and this is a must must watch question yes my dear friends i have discussed in detail about the types of cardiomyopathies and the drugs causing and the conditions producing cardiomyopathies and how does each cardiomyopathy present clinically you can watch them in the video posted by me few days ago so the arch of regime is a regime of choice for non hodgkins lymphoma whereas for hodgkins lymphoma it is a abvd regime which is used which includes adriamycin bleomycin winblastin and dacarbazine so abvd regime includes adriamycin bleomycin winblastin and dacarbazine it is used for hodgkins lymphoma so common side effect of and the, all the anti cancer drugs my dear friends this is a very important physiology concept anti cancer drugs basically act on the rapidly dividing cells and there are two cells in the body which are rapidly dividing which are rapidly dividing and continuously dividing all throughout your life what are they my dear friends two cells in your body which never take rest and they are continuously dividing yes my dear friends they are bone marrow continuously replicating to produce rbc wbc and platelets and number 2 are the gat cells which are continuously getting replicated every year so bone marrow and gat are the two cells of our body which are continuously replicating throughout the year so the most common side effect of any anti cancer drug will be yes bone marrow suppression is universally seen with all the anti cancer drugs and mucositis causing diarrhea is also seen with all the anti cancer drugs and yes hair hair cells are also continuously replicating you must have read in your dermatology tenagen ketogen and the telogen phase of the hair cells so hair cells are also continuously replicating so bone marrow failure diarrhea and alopecia are universally seen with all the anti cancer drugs and increased cell turnover leads to hyperuricemia hyperuricemia is also a common side effect of all the anti cancer drugs so universally all the anti cancer drugs cause bone marrow suppression alopecia mucositis leading to diarrhea and hyperuricemia this is not a topic to mug up my dear friends as the side effect which can be seen in all the anti cancer drugs so coming to our question are a patient on hodgkins lymphoma taking abvd regime develop nausea and vomiting and he develop severe vomiting so what is the site of the brain involved so my dear friend just by knowing that hodgkins lymphoma abvd regime or vomiting you cannot answer this question you must be able to identify the site of the brain involved we all know that it is the area post rema or the chemoreceptor trigger zone which is responsible for vomiting but this knowledge itself is not enough to solve this mcq my dear friend you must also have an in detail knowledge of where the area post rema is located otherwise you will not get your four marks for this question so my dear friend without integrating you cannot gain marks in any exam so the area post rema you must know that it is present caudal to the fourth ventricle just caudal to the medulla and the cerebellum so the area d is the area post rema you must have realized that this is the fourth ventricle and just caudal to this which is forming just the floor of this fourth ventricle is the area post rema so this is the area which has fenestrated capillaries and is susceptible to the action of the systemic drugs thereby producing nausea and vomiting so let's see this image clearly my dear friends the sagittal section of the brain you can you have to identify each and every part of this involved 
so that a future MCQ is possible. What is area number B? What is area number A? What is area number C? What is area number D? So, my dear friends, let's see what each stands for. A is thalamus, my dear friends. So, this is the corpus callosum, this is the splenium, and this is the thalamus. Adjacent to it lies the third ventricle. So, area number A is thalamus. And what is area number B, my dear friends? Area number B is midbrain. This hummingbird appearance classically seen in midbrain. And what is C? C is ventral pons. So, this is the brain stem midbrain, pons, and medulla. And just adjacent to the medulla, just lateral to the medulla, is a chemoreceptor trigger zone on the area of streamer. So, B is midbrain. And what is area number E, my dear friend? What does E represent? Yes, my dear friend, it is cerebellum. So, you must be able to identify each and every neuroanatomy structure. These are basics, my dear friends, and you cannot do them wrong. But you will not get a direct question identify pawns or identify vertebrae of cerebellum. You will be having an integrated question, and that's what differentiates between a good student and the one who does not know how to integrate between different subjects. So, you must integrate your neuroanatomy knowledge with your medicine, and you cannot expect a direct question in any subject. So, A is thalamus. Firstly, this is midbrain, pons, and medulla. So, you have to identify brainstem structures, and pertaining to the brainstem structures, you can identify the other things in the brain. So, the vomiting that results from the administration of systemic chemotherapy is believed to be triggered by the chemoreceptor trigger zone located on the dorsal surface of the midbrain at the caudal of the medulla at the caudal end of the fourth ventricle. Blood brain barrier is typically absent at the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Again, this is a very, very important question, my dear friend. Blood brain barrier is absent at the chemoreceptor trigger zone on the area posting. This what makes susceptible for the drugs acting in the systemic circulation, at the drug entering the systemic circulation through the fenestrated capillaries present here, which allows the circulating chemicals in the blood to come in contact with the area posting. So, again, my dear friend, Penetrated capillaries, blood brain barrier is deficient at the chemoreceptor trigger zone. This is what makes the person go get vomiting and thereby is dehydrated. So, basically, drug given by oral route or IV route entering the systemic circulation, reaching the brain, in the entire brain is covered by the blood brain barrier. There are tight junction between these capillaries, so the drug cannot enter except at one place in the brain where there are penetrated capillaries. And that is the chemoreceptor trigger zone on the area post schema. So the drug enters the brain through this circulation and stimulates the chemoreceptor trigger zone, thereby causing vomiting. This is the mechanism involved, my dear friends. Again, my dear friends, when you see the word penetrated capillaries, you must go back to your physiology and read the three types of capillaries. The three types of capillaries, my dear friends. The first one is the continuous capillaries from the tight junctions of the blood brain barrier. There is no gap between them and no chemical can enter through them. Number two is the fenestrated capillaries. Fenestrations are present between the capillaries and there is it is easily permeable to all the substances. Again, my dear friends, and the third type of capillaries is sinusoidal capillaries. And sinusoidal capillaries present in the sinusoidal capillaries are present in the liver. Yes, my dear friends. So fenestrated capillaries are present in the kidney, villa of small intestine, and brain. This was itself a previous neat question, my dear friend. Penetrated capillaries are present in kidney, villi of small intestine, and brain. Many of us confuse and think that penetrations are also present in the liver. But no, my dear friend, in liver, the type of capillaries are sinusoidal capillaries, but not penetrated capillaries. This was a previous neat question. So, liver contains sinusoidal capillaries. Again, another question may be asked, which of the type of capillaries show the maximum permeability? whether it is continuous capillaries, whether it is penetrated capillaries, or whether it is sinusoidal capillaries. Yes, my dear friends, the maximum permeability is shown by sinusoidal capillaries. So, the thalamus, which helps to coordinate the sensory and the motor system, is also located and we have identified in relation to the, the, the corpus callosum and the third ventricle. Again, my dear friends, all the sensations of the body are relayed in the thalamus except the olfactory sensation but no my dear friends this is a very old concept all the sensations relay in the thalamus including the olfaction yes the olfaction 
the sense of olfaction is also relayed in the thalamus. Previously, four years back, when I read my physiology book, this was a must question that all the sensations relayed in the thalamus except olfaction. But later, later, Guyton and Ganong have updated this information as well. All the sensations relayed in the thalamus, including the olfaction. So, hemianesthesia is a hallmark of thalamic hemorrhage. Yes, my dear friends. Hemianesthesia or hemisensory loss is the hallmark of thalamic hemorrhage as all the sensations in the body relay in the thalamus. Again, my dear friends, it is not rare to find hemiparesis in thalamic hemorrhage or thalamic infection or thalamic infarct. But hemisensory loss occurs first and, and in later cases that two or three days back or when the damage becomes severe or the hemorrhage or infarct increases in size, then you can see hemisensory hemiparesis. So, hemisensory loss first is the hallmark of any thalamic hemorrhage as all the sensations in the body relay in the thalamus. So, the dorsal midbrain is the site of location of the superior and the inferior colloquy. So, superior and the inferior colloquy, you must have read them in the visual pathway and in the auditory pathway. The third ventricle is located dorsal to the structures. Again, my dear friends, you must have read about the superior and the inferior colloquy pertaining to the midbrain. They are together called as corpora quadrigia mena. So, they coordinate eye movements with visual stimuli. Again, my dear friends, this is a simple mnemonic to remember. Eyes are present above the ears. So, you see superior colloquy coordinate the eye movements with the visual stimuli and inferior colloquy coordinate the head movements with the auditory stimuli. So, this is a very important mnemonic and you will remember it quite easily. Superior colloquy in the visual pathway and inferior colloquy take part in the auditory pathway. Again, my dear friend, you might have confused between the lateral geniculate body and the medial geniculate body. Lateral geniculate body stands for light and it is involved in visual pathway. Medial geniculate body, M stands for music and it is involved in auditory pathway. So, superior and inferior colloquy, lateral geniculate body and medial geniculate body. You must right away know which part is involved in which pathway, auditory pathway or visual pathway. You can use the simple mnemonics like eyes are present about ears, so superior are involved in visual pathway. M for music, so me medial geniculate body is involved in hearing. So this is a very important tip my dear friends. You must use your own tips and mnemonics to remain to retain them better. Again my dear friends, I, I would like to emphasize the importance of the 20th notebook here. Every subject contains some dry topics or some topics which need to be marked up and you must write them in this 20th notebook and you must revise them every day at least for an hour. At the end of your preparation, your book will be full of this information which have to be marked up and you don't have any idea how much this book will help you in the last days of your preparation. So start writing the 20th notebook right away. Only those things which don't have any concept and which need to be marked up. So the ventral pons, the pons is a very important structure my dear friends. The pons is important because all the cranial nerves emerge at the junction of the pons and the medulla. The cranial nerves 5 to 8 and arise there and the corticospinal tract also arises from the ventral part pons. I mean there are maximum connections in the ventral pons with the corticospinal. Corticospinal tract actually arises from the cerebral cortex from the area of pets. The medial lemniscus, the lateral spinothalamic tract also goes to this region. So, pontine hemorrhages are very fatal and they result in quadriplegia and bilateral Pepinski. We will see them in the next slides. All the cranial nerves emerge to the ventral aspect of the brainstem except the trochlear nerve or the fourth nerve which em emerges from the dorsal part of the midbrain. Yes, my dear friends, when you see a ventral image of the brain, you will see all the, all the cranial nerves emerging from the ventral side except one nerve which is hooking from the behind and that is trochlear nerve. Yes, this has been a potential visual based question. So, let's see the ventral aspect of the brain. Friends, let's see what are the cranial nerves and where do they emerge from. So, we can see that the olfactory and the optic nerve, they emerge, they have a separate path and they have been discussed separately in, in our lectures. So, olfactory and optic path have the separate path will start from the oculomotor nerve. Olfactory and ocul optic nerve, the optic pathway is related to the occipital lobe of the brain and the olfactory pathway is related to the frontal lobe. 
they have a separate pathway and they're the fastest known sensory pathway. The third and the fourth nerves arise from the midbrain. Yes, my dear friend, the oculomotor nerve arises from the from the ventral aspect of the midbrain, and the trochlear nerve arises from the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. And then we have the trigeminal nerve, which arises from the pons. Yes, my dear friends, trigeminal nerve arises from the pons at the location of the pons with the superior superior cerebellar peduncle. So, at the junction of the superior cerebral peduncle and the pons, there is the origin of trigeminal nerve. It has two roots, a motor root and a sensory root, and both of them combine together to form the main trunk of the trigeminal nerve. Again, my dear friends, this is the pontomedullary junction which has been demonstrated. We already saw that the 6, 7 and the 8th nerves arise from the pontomedullary junction. 6th nerve is abducent nerve and 7th nerve is spatial nerve and 8th nerve is vestibular cochlear nerve. So, abducent nerve is the medial most nerve. Again, this is an important tip, my dear friends. M stands for medial and all the nerves which are motor, like the abducent is a pure motor nerve, it lies medially. Again, my dear friends, in trigeminal nerve, the motor root is the medial root, M stands for medial. So, whenever you see anything which is motor or purely motor cranial nerve, it is medial and the sensory roots are usually lateral. So, from the pontomedullary junction, the 6, 7 and the 8th cranial nerves arise. And the 10th nerve and the 9th nerve is the glossopharyngeal nerve, 9, 10 and 11th cranial nerves arise from the medulla. Yes, my dear friends, this is a hypoglossal nerve, which is the 12th nerve, which is the medial motion. As this is the pure motor nerve, so it is arriving medially. But vestibular cochlear nerve, sorry, the ninth nerve, tenth nerve, that is the vagus nerve, and the hypoglossal and the spinal accessory nerve, these arise laterally. 9, 10, and 11 arise laterally, and 12th nerve, hypoglossal nerve, arises medially. You can see this, this is the pyramid, and this is the olive. Junction between the pyramid and olive arising medially is the hypoglossal nerve, and just lateral to the olive are arising 9, 10, and 11th cranial nerve. So, this is a brief description of how you can memorize the type of the cranial nerves. So, this is the dorsal aspect of the midbrain, my dear friends, and there is only one nerve arising from the dorsal aspect of the midbrain, and that is the trochlear nerve. This has been an important question, my dear friend, so I am emphasizing it many times. So, let's see clinical scenario number two. A four-year-old Asian boy is brought to your OPD by his mother because of facial hair growth. Physical examination reveals enlarged genitalia, pubic hair growth, and impaired upward gaze. Which of the following is the most likely location of the brain lesion in this patient? Again, my dear friend, let's see the question carefully. A four-year-old with facial hair growth. Four-year-old will not have facial hair growth. So the one thing that strikes my mind is precocious puberty. Enlarged genitalia, pubic hair growth, and impaired upward gaze. So precocious puberty arising and then associated with impaired upward gaze or visual disturbances. So I suspect there is something in the brain which is compressing the visual gaze center, thereby producing the pressure symptoms. So I realize that this pathology is in the brain because it is associated with upward gaze. But the most common cause of precocious puberty is, my dear friend, not related to central causes but related to adrenal or ovarian or testicular tumor. Most commonly, precocious puberty is associated with congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Which of the following is the most likely location of the brain lesion in this patient? Again, my dear friends, to know that this is a central cause is itself not enough to solve this MCQ. You must know which kind of tumor compresses the visual gaze center and what does this tumor exactly locate in the CT on a MRI picture of the brain? So, such kind of questions pertaining to the anatomical structure of the brain in the CT and MRI have been asked multiple times. Need 2018, there were three questions. Need 2019, there were two questions. Need 2020, there were two questions. So, this is very important. You must be your concepts about the anatomy of the brain and identifying the structures in the CT and MRI must be rock solid. Otherwise, you will not get these questions right. So, let's see what each one of these structures stands for. Firstly, like I already said, take out the brainstem separate. D is midbrain, E is pons, and G is medulla. F is cerebellum. What is A, and what is C, and what is B, my dear friends? Let's see. So, C is 
pineal gland my dear friend so it is the pineal gland tumor which is enlarging and compressing the tectum of the midbrain so this is the pineal gland my dear friends this is the tumor if, if there is any pineal gland tumor it enlarges and compresses the tectum of the midbrain like we already saw tectum of the midbrain is the dorsal part of the midbrain containing the superior colloquy and the inferior colloquy at the corpora quadrigem minor the superior colloquy i shall present above the ears so you you get superior colloquy associated with visual pathway so upward gaze palsy due to the compression of the tectum of the midbrain by the growing tumor of the pineal gland what is e my dear friends a a is suprasellar region so c is the pineal gland a is the suprasellar region what is b my dear friends b what does it stand for yes it is a thalamus my dear friend so we already saw the lesions of the thalamus has, are associated with hemisensory loss with, because thalamus is the release center for all the sensations of the body including olfaction d is the dorsal midbrain or the tectum of the midbrain which contains the superior and inferior colloquy e is the pons my dear friends and g is medulla and f is cerebellum so it is clear i have i emphasized this topic twice so that you get the brain stem and the related structures correct because brain stem stroke and brain stem syndromes are very easy my dear friends and you just need to identify the anatomy of these questions to get your four marks so let's see what is the answer the answer of this question is pineloma which is c pineloma arising from the pineal gland compressing the tectum of the midbrain associated with superior gaze palsy what is the syndrome called my dear friends what is the syndrome called yes it is paranoid syndrome so paranoid syndrome compression of the visual bait causing visual symptoms so let's see what is precocious puberty growth of the facial and pubic hair associated with enlarged genitalia in a boy younger than 9 years of age boy younger than 9 years and girl younger than 7 years so it is important my dear friend boy younger than 9 years developing pubic hair and axillary hair and facial hair is precocious puberty for girls precocious puberty is defined as the appearance of secondary sexual characters before the age of 7 a number of diseases can cause precocious puberty including congenital adrenal hyperplasia ovarian and adrenal tumor again my dear friends congenital adrenal hyperplasia is the most common cause of precocious puberty you know, overall and in both boys and girls and ovarian tumors are the most common cause of precocious puberty in girls the association of precocious puberty with neurological abnormalities such as paralysis of the upward gaze suggests a hormone secreting tumor such neurological abnormalities are caused by mass effect so it is a central cause how did we know that it is it is a central cause of precocious puberty because it has an associated symptom of upward gaze palsy so we know that it is a central cause of precocious puberty so even though the image was not given you would have known that paranoid syndrome exists and it causes visual symptoms you would have right away gone with the answer pineloma so paralysis of the upward gaze palsy with with compressive symptom is called paranoid syndrome or dorsal midbrain syndrome this neurological finding is consistent with the tumor of the pineal this neurological finding is consistent with the tumor of the pineal gland again my dear friends germinomas are the most common tumors of the pineal gland again if i ask you a question the most common site of germinoma no my dear friends it cannot be pineal gland the most common site of germinoma is gonads itself that's the most important question the second most common site of germinoma is no it is the mediastinum which is the second most common cause of germinoma most common site of germinoma and the third most common site of germinoma is pineloma germinomas are the malignant tumors thought to originate from the embryonic germ cells the germ cell neoplasms have identical counterparts that occur in the gonads and the mediastinum germinomas are found in children and adolescents and show a strong male predominance so my dear friends we saw a 5 year old male boy brought to us with precocious puberty so this precocious puberty associated with pineloma or germinoma are most commonly seen in boys so in the question we emphasize that it is a boy who is the patient here paranoid syndrome incurs paralysis of the upward gaze and of convergence these symptoms occur due to the compression of the midbrain we already saw the pineal gland in association with the midbrain and it is growing to to compress the tectum of the midbrain leading to upward gaze palsy and also a convergence palsy
Again, my dear friend, you must know the compressive symptoms which are most common cause when a child comes to you with the pineuloma, when, a, when an adult comes to you with paranoid syndrome, and when an elderly comes to you with paranoid syndrome. So, the compressive symptoms may not be the same in each age group. Pertaining to the age group of the patient, you must make the diagnosis. This is where the epidemiology and the statistics are very important, my dear friend. You cannot keep a diagnosis of pineuloma in a 60-year-old male patient. You have to know what are the causes which are pertaining to each common age group. So, when a child comes to you with paranoid syndrome, the first thing you should think is pineuloma. And the pineuloma is the germinoma of the pineal gland. And the second thing is aqueduct stenosis. Aqueduct stenosis, like you already know, my dear friends, Aqueduct of Sylvius converting the third ventricle with the fourth ventricle, connecting the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle, leading to accumulation of the CSF, and then there, there are signs of rise diacity and papillary. So, aqueduct stenosis, pineuloma, and meningitis, these are the most common cause of paranoid syndrome in a child. Again, my dear friends, I would like to ask you one more question. What is the most common cause of meningitis in children? Most common cause of meningitis in children? Yes, it is caused by staph areas. Most common cause of meningitis in India is, is due to Klebsiella. Yes, my dear friends. In young adults, it is caused due to demyelination and or by trauma and maybe malformations. What is the demyelinating disorder? You know, my dear friends. Most important, in young adults, yes, it is multiple sclerosis. Trauma and maybe malformations are also more, more common cause of compressive symptoms in young adults, which is leading to paranoid syndrome. And an elderly compressing with visual gaze symptoms and paranoid syndrome, you must think of vascular accidents and posterior fossa aneurysm. What type of vascular accidents are common in elderly? Yes, my dear friends, hemorrhages due to stroke or CVA and embolic phenomenon and also cerebral amyloid angiopathy. Cerebral amyloid angiopathy is the one which is exclusive to elderly and it leads to many lacunar infarcts within the brain. And posterior fossa aneurysms are also common in the elderly. So, pertaining to the age group, you must be able to know the cause of the paranoid syndrome. So, you see that it is a homogeneously enhancing tumor in the third ventricle, which is the pineal, pineal gland tumor. Pinealoma, growing tumor, compressing the tectum of the midbrain, so it is known as pinealoma or the germinoma. This is the classical image, my dear friends. You cannot get it wrong in the exam. So, pineal gland tumor compressing the tectum of the midbrain below leading to compressive symptoms known as paranoid syndrome. Again, my dear friends, this is the pineal gland. This is a very clear image, my dear friends. This is the pineal gland just lateral to the third ventricle and just above the midbrain. You can see this is the midbrain and when this pineal gland tumor enlarges, when this pineal gland tumor enlarges, you will get what is known as pineal gland tumor enlarging. This is known as paranoid syndrome. This is what we saw in our image. So, this is the pineal gland and this is the third ventricle. And when this the pineal gland enlarges and it compresses the tectum of the midbrain, it leads, it leads to a condition known as paranoid syndrome. This is the pineal gland, my dear friends, located posteriorly. And this is the hypophysis or the pituitary gland located anteriorly. Whenever there is enlargement of the pituitary gland, it compresses the optic chiasma. So, this is leading to bitemporal hemianopia. So, compressive symptoms of the pituitary to the optic chiasma leading to bitemporal hemianopia and pineal gland enlarging, compressing the tectum of the midbrain leading to paranoid syndrome. So, these are the things you need to learn with your clinical correlation with neuroanatomy. So, neuroanatomy has to be at your fingertips to get these questions right. Again, my dear friends, most common location of germinoma is gonads and not pineal. You cannot get this wrong, my dear friends. The commons are to be thought first and then you need to think about the rare diagnosis. Because if you make a common diagnosis, you are commonly correct. So, the most common location of germinoma is gonads and not pineal gland. Second most common location is also not pineal gland, but it is the, the mediastinum. And the third most common location is the pineal gland. But histology remains the same for all these and it resembles the seminoma histologically. Again, my dear friends, you, you should go back to pathology basic and you should know how a seminoma slides looks, looks like. You can see all these are clear, clear cells. Clear cells filled with glycogen reserve. 
all these blue blue clear cells with a with a hazy cytoplasm or a ground glass appearance of the cytoplasm and then you have septae between these clear cells with infiltrating lymphocyte septae with infiltrating lymphocytes plus clear cells with glycogen rich cells you need to think of the diagnosis of seminoma so septae with lymphocyte and glycogen rich cells with clear cytoplasm this is a classical slide of seminoma and this slide is similar to that of a germinoma whether it is present in gonads or whether it is present in mediastinum or whether it is present in pineal gland the, the, the histology remains the same and it is easy for you to recognize whether it is germinoma by the histology itself syndromes associated with pineal germinomas precocious puberty may occur in males and it is caused by excess beta hcg production aqueduct compression of the tumor may lead to obstructive hydrocephalus again my dear friend the signs of raised ict and obstructive hydrocephalus again my dear friend you must know that in neonates and infants the signs of raised ict are less visible because their skull bones are very flexible and they are different the signs of raised ict and neonates and in adults are also different germinoma occur neither in the suprasolar region we saw the image they do not occur in the thalamus nor in the midbrain so germinoma classical occur in the pineal gland so if you know that tectum of midbrain is compressed and if you will answer the question as midbrain you cannot get your justification of the precocious puberty so this is the pineal gland compressing the midbrain then producing the symptom so in this way you will integrate the subjects my dear friends let's see about other options what does other option c pontine hemorrhage this was one of the option my dear friends pontine hemorrhage we'll see about the different types of hemorrhages and their locations in the brain pontine hemorrhages or tumor may cause locked in syndrome which is known as spastic quadriplegia and paralysis of almost all the cranial nerves like I already emphasized in the video my dear friends we saw at the ponto medullary junction the 6 7 and the 8th cranial nerves were arising so paralysis of all these cranial nerves and resulting in locked in syndrome or spastic quadriplegia again my dear friends when there there was hemiplegia babinski was positive on one side whenever whenever there is spastic quadriplegia there is bilateral babinski positive so pontine hemorrhage is a very important cause of bilateral babinski positive so classically this is the arrow representing the pontine hemorrhage my dear friends so this is the pontine hemorrhage seen in this ct image and this is the pontine hemorrhage seen in this sagittal section so both in this coronal and sagittal section you must be able to identify where does the pontine hemorrhage look like and this is classically a quadriplegic patient in the ward so classically quadriplegia or locked in syndrome seen in pontine hemorrhage again my dear friends this is the classical image showing the pontine hemorrhage in the brain so locked in syndrome the most common syndrome bilateral ventral pontine lesions produce the locked in syndrome or the spastic quadriplegia quadriplegia due to bilateral corticospinal tract involvement again my dear friends we saw in the first slide the importance of the corticospinal tract in the spinothalamic tract getting dispersed to the pons and any pontine hemorrhage the compressed these structures and can lead to quadriplegia aphonia due to involvement of the corticobulbar fibers innervating from the lower cranial nerves so aphonia and quadriplegia and locked in syndrome is the most common site for this pontine hemorrhage occasional impairment of the horizontal eye movements due to bilateral involvement of the classical subcranial nerve 7 can also be seen again my dear friend you must know that the reticular formation is not injured not injured in pontine hemorrhage so the patient is fully awake and alert so the supranuclear ocular pathways slide dorsally and they are also not involved in the reticular formation is not involved so the patient is awake so they actually convey the wishes in the morse code this is a very important thing my dear friends many detectives use this morse code and soldiers use this morse code and you can see that the patient is awake and his ocular pathway is also normal so the patient can communicate in morse code this can be a potential question that the patient is awake but his quadriplegic so reticular formation is not affect, affected and the patient is fully awake in case of pontine hemorrhage again my dear friend pontine hemorrhage is a cause of pinpoint pupil meiotic pupil not responding to light is pinpoint pupil again my dear friend you should not you should be able to differentiate between meiosis and pinpoint pupil pinpoint pupil is a pupil where the 
pupils are not reactive to light and are very small, less than 1 to 2 m. Where meiotic pupils, they may respond to light. So, what are the causes of pinpoint pupil? In the entire medicine, there are only clinically important three causes of pinpoint pupil. The one is organophosphate poisoning, two is opioid poisoning, and three is fontaine hemorrhage. You must be able to differentiate between them clinically. Organophosphate poisoning. You know that organophosphates are the irreversible inhibitor of acetylcholine esterase, leading to increased secretion of acetylcholine all throughout the body. So, all the secretions in the body increase in organophosphate poisoning. In opioid poisoning, the patient is lethargic and comatose, and but there is a history of consumption of opioid drugs like morphine, codeine, or anything. The, you may see for the signs of drug uh, IV drug abuses like the brachial vein, the cephalic vein, or the brachial vein may be used. In in fontaine hemorrhage, we already saw the classical locked in syndrome, quadriplegia. Again, my dear friends, it is a classical case of bilateral MP positive. So. These are the three things which you commonly see in your wards. OP poisoning, opioid poisoning, and fontaine hemorrhages causing pinpoint pupils. Very small pupils, not at all reacting to light, are pinpoint pupils. Again, my dear friends, what are the drugs or the poisoning which causes midriasis? So, dilated pupils not responding to light are classically seen in, yes, my dear friends, atropa belladona or datura poisoning. And again, benzodiazepine or sedative poisoning cause midriatic pupils. So you must be able to differentiate between the drug consumed based on the pupil size, pinpoint pupil in OP poisoning and organophos and opioid poisoning, and mediatic pupil in atropine poisoning, in datura poisoning, and also in benzodiazepine poisoning. So pinpoint pupils are also to be seen in head injury that is subarachnoid hemorrhage and also in Horner syndrome. So in head injury and so that is subarachnoid hemorrhage and Horner syndrome also pinpoint pupils can be seen. So, let's see in detail about the brain hemorrhages involved in the brain and the clinical symptoms which are responsible for each of the organs involved. We'll also see the CT finding of the hemorrhage in the brain. So, we'll complete the hemorrhages of the brain in this slide. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, my dear friends, you must be know that clinical picture of sub subarachnoid hemorrhage. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, classically, the patient presenting with elderly male or female with hypertension or young patient with hypertension or a known case of berry aneurysm producing subarachnoid hemorrhage with the ventricles filled with the blood. The classical symptom is thunderclap headache or the worst headache in the life of the patient. The patient classically describes it to be the worst headache of the life of the patient. But again, my dear friend, you must be aware that there is no focal neurological deficit in a case of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Again, can any one of you say what is the type of CSF seen in subarachnoid hemorrhage? That is, on lumbar puncture, when you aspirate the CSF, what is the type or the color of the CSF? Yes, it is red to orange in color and it is also an important sign which is known as xanthochromia. Again, xanthochromia takes two to three days to develop in a case of subarachnoid hemorrhage. This can also be a potential MCQ. So, subarachnoid hemorrhage, thunderclap headache, first headache in the life of the patient, but Remember, there is no focal neurological deficit. So, a bleed in the basal ganglia. Basal ganglia bleed, classically, the bleed most commonly involves the putamen. Putamen bleed is the most common site of bleed in basal ganglia and it produces unilateral hemiparesis. So, unilateral hemiparesis, basal ganglia bleed is classically seen in case of basal ganglia bleed. Most common site cause of basal ganglia bleed is hypertension. So, hypertensive bleed, putamen bleed, in an elderly male is classically basal ganglia bleed. Again, my dear friends, subarachnoid hemorrhage most common causes trauma and most common non-traumatic cause is rupture of the berry aneurysm. Hypertension can also cause but it is very rare. So, trauma, trauma or most commonly rupture of the berry aneurysm is the most common causes of subarachnoid hemorrhage, basal ganglia bleed, the most common causes hypertension, most commonly presenting with the putamen. Thalamic bleed. Again, my dear friends, we saw that all the sensations in the body relay in the thalamus. So, there is only hemianesthesia initially in case of thalamic bleed. Again, my dear friends, there can be hemiparesis in the later stages of thalamic bleed. But only in the initial stages, there is hemianesthesia. Fontaine bleed. We already saw fontaine bleed produces quadriplegia or locked in syndrome. As it is quadriplegia, there is bilateral Babinski positive. 
cerebellar bleed or fibular hemorrhage again my dear friends there is no paralysis in case of cerebellar bleed you must be thorough with it there is gait ataxia apraxia intention tremor intention tremor and nystagmus again my dear friends you must be knowing the cause of resting tremor intention tremor is seen in cerebellar lesion intention tremor and macrographia are seen in cerebellar lesion whereas resting resting tremor and micrographia are to be seen in which neurological condition yes it is the parkinson's disease so my dear friends identify the ct again my dear friends i already said you must be able to differentiate between ct and mri right on the word go the bone is white in this image so it is the ct image classically showing bleed within the ventricle so it is subarachnoid hemorrhage most common cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is trauma and most common non traumatic cause of subarachnoid hemorrhage is rupture of berry aneurysm so ventricular bleed subarachnoid hemorrhage is the most common cause again my dear friends just lateral to the to the ventricle what is this this is the putamen just yes, my dear friends this is the cordage nucleus and just lateral to it is putamen just lateral to putamen is globus pallidus you must have this neuroanatomy figures in your brain and they must be at your fingertips so so sorry this is the thalamic bleed my dear friends this is subarachnoid hemorrhage this is the thalamic bleed producing hemi anesthesia so this is classically thalamic bleed producing hemi anesthesia let's see what is putamen bleed what is this bleed my dear friends what is this type of hemorrhage yes my dear friends this is the pontian hemorrhage classically seen in a case where it causes quadriplegia and bilateral babinski palsy so we saw what is a thalamic hemorrhage what is subarachnoid hemorrhage the worst headache in the life of the patient what is a thalamic hemorrhage and what is a pontian hemorrhage which causes quadriplegia and locked in syndrome with bilateral babinski palsy remember my dear friends reticular formation and ocular pathway is usually normal and the patient can communicate with you in morse code yes this is the putamen bleed my dear friends you cannot get confused with the putamen bleed and the thalamic bleed so i included both of them this is a thalamic bleed and this is the putamen bleed so classically this is the bleed of the putamen hypertension the most common cause of bleed is in the putamen and the most common site is the putamen just lateral to the putamen is the globus pallidus so a little medial is the thalamic bleed and little lateral is the putamen bleed but you cannot get confused with the putamen bleed is usually larger in size and there is compression of the adjacent ventricles as well so this is the putamen bleed classically seen in hypertensive males and females again where is the bleed my dear friends what is the where is the site of hemorrhage yes my dear friends it is a case of cerebellar hemorrhage again my dear friends this is also a case of cerebellar hemorrhage the characteristic symptoms are ataxia nystagmus and intention tremors so we saw the types of bleed and the localization of the types of bleed lesions of the medulla can cause lateral medullary syndrome and medial medullary syndrome so in both the cases it is the vertebral artery which is most commonly involved than the pica I, I commonly wrote this common name my dear friends they do not call it posterior inferior cerebellar artery pica bleed you must be able to identify that it is lateral medullary syndrome or the wallenberg syndrome so lateral medullary syndrome or the wallenberg syndrome leads to the contralateral loss of pain and temperature and ipsilateral loss of the cranial nerves 5 9 10 and 11 so we already saw in the image that the 9 10 and 11th cranial nerves are related to the medulla and they are more commonly present laterally whereas 12th one is the medial hypoglossal nerve motor nerves are present medially so hypoglossal is involved in medial medullary syndrome whereas in lateral medullary syndrome the 9 10 and 11 cranial nerves in the are involved i already emphasized the origin of the cranial nerves my dear friends in the first few slides so that it becomes for us to get easier which nerves are involved in the lateral medullary syndrome which are involved in the medial medullary syndrome so 9 10 11 11 are involved in the lateral medullary syndrome ipsilateral 5 9 10 11 palsy with contralateral loss of pain and temperature is associated with lateral medullary or wallenberg syndrome again my dear friends in anatomy textbooks it is given that pica is the most common posterior inferior cerebellar artery is artery to be involved in wallenberg syndrome but the latest edition of harrison says that the vertebral artery is more commonly involved than the posterior inferior cerebellar artery 
So the most common cause of involvement in both latent medullary syndrome and medial medullary syndrome is the vertebral artery and it is not posterior. The most common site of involvement of lateral medullary syndrome is vertebral artery more than posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Let's come to see what involves the medial medullary syndrome. Medial medullary syndrome causes spastic paralysis. So medial medullary syndrome classically causes a spastic type of paralysis and also ipsilateral lacet paralysis of the tongue. So tongue is present medially. So 12th cranial nerve, motor nerve present medially involved in medial nerve palsy. So contralateral hemopastic paralysis with ipsilateral involvement of the cranial nerve, it is involved in medial medullary syndrome. Again, my dear friend, you must be thorough that in lateral medullary or Warrenberg syndrome, there is no contralateral hemiplegia because motor pathway or the cortical spinal pathway are present medially and they are not involved in lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. And only in medial medullary syndrome, the motor pathways are involved. The one is cortical spinal leading to contralateral hemiplegia and the one is 12th cranial nerve leading to ipsilateral tongue paralysis. Again, my dear friends, contralateral pain, loss of pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body, but whereas the ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the side of the face due to the involvement of the fifth cranial nerve. So, whenever the fifth cranial nerve is involved, there is contralateral ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the side of the face with contralateral loss of pain and temperature on the side of the body. So, in lateral medullary syndrome, there is ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature on the face due to the involvement of the fifth cranial nerve. Again, my dear friends, in lateral medullary syndrome, there is no hemiplegia. So, we can confuse this penialoma with a, another known tumor of the brain, which is craniopharyngioma, because both of them present with a, present with a supracellular tumors, but a penialoma presents with precocious puberty, a craniopharyngioma presents with polyuria, but not precocious puberty. So, this is the way we can clinically differentiate a four year old male presenting with precocious puberty. Think of penialoma first. And just adjacent to the pineal gland is the supracellular region. We saw the, in the image what is the importance of the supracellular area because the craniopharyngioma can usually be de detected in the supracellular region. So, I have included these two tumors because they are the common tumors of the childhood and they are present different clinically and you must be able to identify what is the exact location of the tumors in the MRI of the CT of the brain. Grossly, craniopharyngiomas have a cyst with a dark motor oil fluid consistency. Correlating with the histopathology, they appear as a cord or nest of palisading squamous epithelial cell tumors. Again, my dear friends, in my previous video, I already talked about what is the importance of palisading. Palisading is the epithelial cells, normal squamous epithelial cells, making a bridge out of the tumor cells. This is called as true palisading. True palisading is seen in craniopharyngioma and also in acoustic neuroma and schwannoma. Pseudopalisading. Pseudopalisading is the areas of necrosis and thereby between beneath the areas of necrosis these epithelial cells are present and they appear as if they are palisading these areas of necrosis this is seen in medulloblastoma child plus cerebellum plus rosette presenting as medulloblastoma you must not forget these things my dear friends i have emphasized on the brain tumors and on the topic in detail in my previous video you can watch it later so, craniopharyngioma present with internal areas of cystic degeneration, calcification, and xanthogranulomatous reactions with chain cells. So, due to these xanthogranulomas, you can see dark motor fluid oil consistency. But craniopharyngiomas present with polyuria or diabetes insipidus. What is this type of diabetes insipidus known as, my dear friends? It is central or peripheral. Yes, it is central type of diabetes insipidus. Let's try to differentiate between the three types of diabetes insipidus. Again, my dear friends, I am extending this topic because you must be able to integrate the topics of medicine with anatomy. Whenever you hear the word central diabetes insipidus, you must read about how, how do you differentiate between peripheral diabetes insipidus, peripheral or nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and psychogenic polydipsia. So, classically, it is showing supracellular calcification and it is a region of craniopharyngioma. Where is the pineal gland, my dear friends? It is present just posteriorly here. So, anteriorly, it is the craniopharyngioma presenting with a rim of calcification, cystic lesion. On aspiration, you will get a machine oil-like consistency of the fluid. So, this is the craniopharyngioma. You cannot confuse it with the pineal gland tumor or penioloma. 
Penal Danchuma, Chael brought with precocious puberty, craniopharyngioma, Chael brought with anosmia and polyuria. Again, my dear friends, this is the classical histopathological imaging showing true palisading in a case of craniopharyngioma. This is what is true palisading. The squamous epithelial cell just forming a fence out of the tumor cell. So this is the palisading seen in craniopharyngioma. So supracellular calcification with the rim of calcification classically seen in craniopharyngioma. Again, it is a cause of central diabetes insipidus, my dear friends, because the pituitary gland doesn't make enough ADH. The kidneys make a lot of urine. ADH is involved in the absorption of the urine from the collecting duct and the distal DCT. And whenever this water is not absorbed, the urine volume increases, thereby it causes diabetes insipidus, and the urine osmolality decreases. Urine volume increases and the urine osmolality decreases. So this is a case of central diabetes insipidus. Let's see how can we differentiate between the different types of diabetes insipidus. Firstly, we have got the central diabetes insipidus, the nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and the psychogenic diabetes insipidus. Remember my difference, the urine osmolality remains low in all the three, in central, nephrogenic, and psychogenic diabetes insipidus. In psychogenic diabetes insipidus, the person or the patient itself is drinking more of water and therefore is passing a lot of urine and therefore his urine osmolality falls low. Again, my dear friends, the urine volume is more in any kind of diabetes insipidus. So, the central, nephrogenic, and psychogenic, the urine osmolality, urine volume is more and also in urine osmolality is less. But sudden in onset is central diabetes insipidus. When our the central diabetes insipidus, which is sudden in onset due to a tumor, most commonly as we saw in this case, it was a craniopharyngioma. Serum sodium may be normal to low in a case of psychogenic diabetes insipidus. So let's see the tests we can do which can differentiate between nephrogenic and psychogenic diabetes insipidus. So the first test you do is water deprivation test. Whenever there is water deprivation test positive, the psychogenic diabetes insipidus, the urine osmolality increases. So after fluid deprivation or in primary polydipsia, the urine osmolality is more than 800. So water deprivation test is used to differentiate between primary polydipsia and between nephrogenic or neurogenic diabetes insipidus. So whenever there is water deprivation, the urine osmolality increases and the urine volume decreases, then it is a case of primary polydipsia. So water deprivation rules out psychogenic diabetes, in, diabetes insipidus. After desmopressin analog, desmopressin is the ADH analog. So whenever the brain is not producing ADH, you are giving it from outside. So the urine osmolality increases and it becomes more than 800 in case of neurogenic diabetes insipidus. So desmopressin analog, response to desmopressin analog, we rules out neurogenic diabetes insipidus and response to water deprivation rules out polydipsia. So nephrogenic diabetes insipidus is a diagnosis of exclusion and it cannot be cured either by desmopressin analog or by water deprivation. So at the end of the day, it is the fluid deprivation which improves psychogenic polydipsia and it is the desmopressin analog which improves the central diabetes insipidus. In this case, the child classically presented with polyuria and we saw that in relation to the supracellular tumor showing a rim of calcification, grossly tumor with the areas of necrosis and also fat globules are also present. On histopathology, there were xanthogranulomatous reactions. We saw pseudo-true palisading is seen with craniopharyngioma and acoustic neuroma or schwannoma and pseudo-palisading is seen with medulloblastoma. Child plus cerebellum plus resid medulloblastoma classically spreads by CSF drop metastasis. So that's all for today, my dear friends. Tomorrow I'll come up with one more video integrating medicine and neuroanatomy. So stay tuned for more updates and keep studying, my dear friends. Thank you.